Happy Sunday. Very happy to see so many of you back with us this morning. And as Brother Healthy has mentioned earlier, we have reached a stage on the COVID fighting uh, strategy at a, a kind of a milestone, right? So the government has announced relaxation of the rules and regulation. For us in particular, it means that all of you can come here without registration. You just turn up. So many of you keep texting me and said the registration page disappeared. How? I said, you know, you just turn up. Uh, the idea is that if you are wearing masks in here, you don't have to have safety distancing. You don't have to, you know, have a lot of all these restrictions anymore. And starting next week, you can sing. So all my pianists, please get ready. Uh, we're going to dust off the piano and have you come back here. And uh, some people have asked me whether we are going to stop the live broadcast and transmission. I think that we will observe it for a while first. Uh, the idea is that, you know, if we have live uh, broadcast, you will not turn out here. So to some extent, you, you, you should come here. If you don't come here, then I will cut off the live broadcast. To some, uh, there, there's some convenience for the live broadcast, especially for our brothers and sisters who have traveled overseas. We have many brothers and sisters who are overseas, and it's quite interesting that uh, they are on with us. And right before we started, somebody just texted me from London because it's one of our old people who are there. So quite fascinating that... Uh, people are coming on live, watching us as well. And there is something about knowing that whatever you're watching is live, as opposed to something is pre-recorded. So it's a bit tricky. So I'm going to observe this very, very carefully. Uh, and so, uh, but the point is that, see, as I've been preaching for so many sessions, right, we do not want to walk the journey of faith alone. And so as the Bible has commanded us, gathering together regularly is a very important thing so that you will continue to live with one another and serve one another and show your concern and love for one another. And so the physical gathering of the people is important. And our church place emphasis on that as well. So for example, Holy Communion, we don't do virtual Holy Communion. We want you to be here to do Holy Communion. And many different people have different interpretation with that. I, I'm quite surprised some of the brethren church, because they do Holy Communion every single week. Uh, I'm quite surprised that they actually have a virtual uh, Holy Communion. But of course, the world is changing rapidly and so many, many unknowns are happening all around the world. One of the other things that I want to let you know is that the senior pastor is here today um, and he's here in Singapore for medical checkup and he, as usual, will take the opportunity to preach. So this, uh, in about half an hour time, he will be over at the other side in the Bahasa Indonesia service preaching, you know, watching whether you will stand up and all leave. Because of <laughs> and of course, this evening, he will be at Two-Way Presbyterian Church doing the uh, Indonesian service first and then the Mandarin service in the evening and I will translate for him. And I'm very excited to, to meet him because I haven't seen him for more than two years, you know. So the way life twists and turns is really very hard to predict, right? We don't even know what is going to happen to us tomorrow. So exactly as Jesus Christ said, while there is still daylight, we better serve the Lord because we don't know what will happen to us. Now today we want to carry on with the expository preaching in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. I've entitled the sermon, Pure Good and Sincere. Let's quickly review what was taught last week. Last week was the first time we went into First Timothy and I started off, by laying the ground, by reminding you of the whole counsel of God. What is it that God wants us to know in our life? We are certain that everything that we need to know about faith, about salvation, about life, they are all found in the counsel of God in His Word. And in this, there are certain layers to it. And uh, I you remember that chart that I showed you. First, you have your individual verses that we a lot of us just hold on to in our life. We, we look at the verses, we know that the verses are speaking to us or speaking about certain way we need to behave. But that's not good enough, actually. You need to look at the verse in the context of the, the chapter, and from the chapter itself, the context of the book, from the book itself in the context of the other books in the Bible. And finally, as senior pastor has brought up, the general principles of the whole Bible. So we do believe that God, through his infinite and perfect wisdom, has decided to reveal his view to us through this, the Bible. 39 Old Testament book, 27 New Testament books. 
And of course, the light of nature is also important, but still under the general principles of the Bible. What does that mean? That means that if something is not specifically written in the Bible, by reasoning the light of nature that God has given to us, we can figure it out, like the way we worship. The Bible does not describe how we should worship, but by the general principles of the Bible, we are free to determine each different style. Uh, even dress codes and all that, you know, cultural differences, these are all right, so long as you follow the general principles of the Bible. And the Bible has many different kinds of genres of, of literature, uh, the narrative, the poetry, wisdom. Earlier you read from Proverbs, that's wisdom, prophecy, gospels, letters, the epistles, apocalypse writing. Now these are just very generic kind of description. So God, through his perfect wisdom, has allowed many different people throughout many generations to write his word through many different forms. And in particular for us, the general, the epistles of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles can be segregated into general epistles, church epistles, prison epistles, and pastoral epistles. So 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, these are pastoral episodes where Paul wrote to a pastor, a person who is pastor, pastoring a church, and at the same time pastoral in nature, where Paul really cared for the person he wrote to. So the, the letters become very, very personal. And again, we do believe that the Holy Spirit used these writings to speak to us through all generations. So it's not just confined to the, the, the people that uh, Timothy were, uh, was administering to or personal only to Timothy, but it is a letter that is meant for us all. And this is not something which I say, you know. From the early church, they have done that. They will read the letter out for everybody, understanding that God is guiding the apostles in this particular way. So Timothy in particular, it was the subject of the letter and he is known as Timothy of Ephesus because he was a pastor at a church that the apostle Paul founded. So sometimes they use the word bishop. And, and uh, when Paul wrote to him, the first thing Paul asserted was that he was an apostle. And so I spent some time talking about apostleship because these days there are people who proclaim themselves apostle. I mentioned to you that in Singapore, there are at least two persons who call themselves apostle. So what this means is that instead of the usual Pastor Yong, it becomes Apostle Yong. It's a very big name. And so we wanted to understand a little bit what it means. And I spent a little bit of time running through, you know, some of the qualification of Apostle. For us, it, it, it boils down to a person who has seen our Lord Jesus Christ and clearly identified by the Holy Spirit to be an Apostle and confirmed by spectacular and genuine signs and wonders. Not the kind of healing that you see today in charismatic churches, not that kind of thing, but very serious kind of signs and wonders. Like the shadow of the Apostle Peter could heal and the personal artifacts like the apron or the handkerchief of Apostle Paul also could heal. And that's really, you, you know of nothing like that today. Although a lot of people try to pretend and, you know, till today, later I'll touch on a little bit to it. People sell cloth that they have touched and say that, you know, uh, these, are, these are by faith God-anointed servants, same as the New Testament. But there's nothing like that today. Therefore, we reject the idea that there's an office of apostle today or even the office of the prophet because the canonical Bible has been formed already. This Bible we have at the hand is the Bible that God has intended for us to have already. So therefore, we do not need to have another apostle or another uh, prophet appearing to us. The Apostle Paul then went on in his usual greeting and he used this very unusual word, Christ Jesus, our hope. And I told you that this is a key title used in the early church because they faced so many, many challenges, so many life-threatening kind of a problems that the early church faced. And they hang on their hope completely on Christ Jesus. And I told you that it's not only in the early church. Today is the same for us as well. And I went on to describe to you how when the Bible uses the word hope, it's not just a wish that we kind of use every time we use the word hope, but an assurance, an expectation of something that will surely come. So when you use the word Christ Jesus, our hope, it means that there's an expectation that Jesus will come and fulfill everything that he has done. So it's a little bit different not a little bit, a lot of difference between that and the way we understand hope to be. And finally, 
we read from the Apostle Paul that this is the nature of our Christian hope. And this is why patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us don't have that patience, right? In life, we want things to be solved immediately. We want ministry to work immediately. So many people go into ministry work, get very frustrated because, you know, you try very hard and people don't seem to come. They don't seem to believe. They don't seem to want to listen to you. Sometimes in relationship in our life, we meet someone, we marry this person, and then we argue with the person, get upset, and we, we don't have the patience to wait for things to happen. We want things to happen immediately. Give me some solution, tomorrow it will happen. That's not how it works. Because God is a God of patience as well, and He has built the world in a way where there's a lot of paradox involved. And hope is exactly where you do not see it, that way, that that's when you need hope and that's where you need faith. And so we ended the sermon by saying that we need to trust in Christ Jesus, our hope, with patience. So today we go on to the next set of verses. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and commit the time to His hand. We thank you, God, for giving us this privilege to come before you in such a simple and such a comfortable manner while, as Brother Hardy has prayed earlier, the world is in such a turmoil. And so help us to right now be appreciative, be humbled, be, have that deep understanding that the opportunity is not given to anybody on, the, in, on this world. So give us this appreciative heart, a heart that is teachable and willing to listen to your voice. Because when we hear your voice, we will recognize it. And having recognized your voice, we will surely turn and follow you. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go straight to the verse itself then. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul wrote, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain people, persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God. That is my faith. So from here, it's very clear that the apostle, sorry, Timothy was a pastor of a church in Ephesus. So as the Apostle Paul was traveling, he gave instruction to Timothy to stay at Ephesus, the city, with a church that Paul was founded. But the word that he used is quite interesting. You may charge. That means you may command. You may go and rebuke. You may go out and, and insist. So he was a pastor of a church with appointed authority to charge and to command people. So this is one of the role of a pastor a person who is the shepherd of the flock, that we get to charge or we get to command you. And so church discipline is a very important aspect of our existence, especially in the Reformed Evangelical Church. And we do uh, instill church discipline in some ways. And in the later chapters, I will discuss it in further details. But for example, we may stop people from having Holy Communion uh, if we know that this person is committing an outright public sin. At the worst case scenario, sometimes we excommunicate people. Excommunicate means we declare to the congregation that this person is no longer part of our community and we will have nothing to do with this person anymore. And it has happened in our church several times. Usually, excommunication happens when there is a situation like a very public sin, like adultery, and when the party that committed the sin is unrepentant. So typically, we will try our very best to try to to counsel, to try to, to in the, with the love of God, to try to bring back the situation. But there will come a point in time where the people involved would turn around and tell us, you know, forget it, don't come and talk to me anymore. And if that person is a member of our church, we will excommunicate that person. Of course, in the Roman Catholic tradition, it gets even more complicated. Roman Catholics believe that excommunication by the 
bishop or the, the priest is a very serious thing. You can be cast into hell, you know, for that. And for the longest time in history, that is the hold that the Roman Catholics have over politicians like your kings and your queens and what have you. Because the Pope has the authority to cast you into hell. Therefore, they have authority over all who proclaim themselves Roman Catholic. So there's a shadow of that in this. But in this particular case, the Apostle Paul was talking about things that are relating to the teachings that the people has received. In particular, there are some areas that he was focused on. That there are people apparently who are teaching some other doctrines. And these doctrines has to do with two broad areas, myths and endless genealogies. Now, which means that in the early church, from the very beginning, there were people who were moving around the churches other than the original past, the, the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ who taught the real gospels. There were also a lot of people who came up with many, many ideas, including myths that are all mixed together. Now remember that the New Testament is largely written in Greek. And so Greek culture is very, very strong in the early church and together with Roman culture. And so many of the myths got to do with Greek mythology. A lot of ideas about how the gods came about. I am particularly interested in all kinds of mythology, you know, because I'm interested in religion as a whole. And being bicultural, I'm very familiar with Chinese mythology. And when I was studying in the university, I took a course in Greek mythology. And the two are quite similar in nature. And there are many gods and very colorful. You have Zeus, you have Hera, you have all kinds of Apollo, and, and their stories are all quite fascinating and the very creative idea of how the gods came to be. But there is a major difference between Greek mythology and Chinese mythology. The creativity is pretty similar. However, Greek mythology is filled with sex, but Chinese mythology has very little of that. So from there, you see the difference between Western and Eastern culture. You know, their, their emphasis are quite different. And in Greek mythology, the gods will do all kinds of things. They, they, they basically have uh, affairs with human beings and all kinds of things happen when, when that happened. Because then the human being will give birth to demi-gods and some of the gods have a, a bull head and a human body or all kinds of crazy stuff all coming together. So the early church was born in an era with this sort of cultural influences. And so therefore all these things kind of seep into the church as well. And it's very exciting to talk about how perhaps this apostle or this uh, or Lord Jesus Christ himself was, you know, born in this way or that way. And so a lot of myth came into being. Now, as to genealogy, the, the concept is that the gods or whoever has a lot of power must have come from some lineage of sort that has a lot of power. And so this is actually a, it's a little bit too small for you to see, a genealogy of Greek gods. There's Zeus, there's Hera, and then after that, it comes down to dong, 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 all these kind of god. Where the Apollo come from? Poseidon is the brother and all kinds of things in a big, messy genealogy kind of concept. And of course, in the early church also, there is the obsession of genealogy of Jewish people. So when we read the Bible, right, for example, Matthew. Matthew started out with the genealogy of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The genealogy of all the way from Adam, and then there's a listing of major ancestors. Not all the ancestors, major ancestors. So you see that there is some obsession or some emphasis placed on genealogy. And where did these people come from? And so, you know, the early church have a lot of people who come together to do this. One of the classic and very big theology or thinking back in those days is called Gnosticism. I don't want to go to too much detail, but you will hear this word appearing often when you attend church conferences and seminars relating to early church kind of uh, thinking. Now, the Gnostics were very big in the early church. Uh, basically, it's the belief that human beings contain a piece of God, uh, the highest good or a divine spark within themselves, and somehow, you know, we, we, we were once uh, holy and uh, spectacular and divine, and then we sort of fall into the Im 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 immaterial world, into the body of human. And, and this world is a terrible world. All physical matter is subject to decay, rotting, and death. 
And those body and the material world created by an inferior being are therefore evil. And so our body, the way we live our life, these are all like, you know, it's quite horrible, it's evil. And that spark of divinity in us get trapped into the material world. But we don't know about this. And so we need to go and discover this particular spark, that, that spirituality. And whoever that can come and tell us how to be delivered from it, he's the saviour, he's the redeemer. Can you recognize similarity between this and some of the religion even we can find in Singapore? So the Gnostic influence actually uh, permeates into many, many religions, right? I mean, the idea that this world is a terrible world, we, we, we are some kind of enlightened being traveling in this world and just that we don't know it yet and then some savior will come and tell us and we we'll find in ourselves that enlightenment. So these are very common human idea that influence the Gnostic, influence the local religion, even influence science fiction. Those of you who watch Star Trek, Star Wars and all that, you can find elements of this kind of Gnostic thinking uh, inside there, right? Uh, it, it is about the force, you know, may the force be with you and you the dark side or the force, good side of the force. It's all like one big jumbo coming in together. So the early church had to face all these things, all come out together. I, I always think that it must be very frustrating to be an apostle because, you know, all these people are all out there. I mean, you teach them and you build a church and you leave, go to somewhere else to start another church. And in the meantime, all these things happen and you get to hear from others who meet you. And you know, the church you just set up in Amokyo, you know what happened? Now they are talking about this and that. And then at that time, it's very difficult to travel. It's not like I can send an email, you know. So Paul had to write letter to warn them. But my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we come to a passage like that, right, I don't know whether you're thinking to yourself, oh no, Pastor Young is going to talk about false teachers again. It's like, wow, he don't know talk about false teaching how many times we or false prophets. The fact is that the myth and the genealogies that the Apostle Paul faced, today is still the same thing. Sometimes we say that the more things change, the more things remain the same. Probably early church till now. And I suppose it's also part of the tricks of the devil, who has been working for thousands of years, uh, by the way, that the same kind of situation we do face even till today. Of course, we no longer go for Greek mythology. Now, if you are still worshiping some, worshiping some Greek god, something is very wrong with you. But the myth and mythology of other religions, especially the Chinese religion, is they are still very much alive, isn't it? But the bigger challenge is the myth and mythology and, and the obsession with genealogies within the Christian church itself. In the Christian church today, all the way from the early church to today, it has never really disappeared. One of the biggest things that is going that is happening around the, the, the Christian world today is this idea that somebody has died and for a moment of time gone to heaven or gone to hell. I mean, you can just Google it and you will find many, many, many people giving testimony about that. Either they have gone to heaven or either they have gone to hell. And then, of course, come back. You know, and they came back. And so I'm going to bear a testimony to tell you how wonderful heaven is or how, how horrifying health is. And in the United States of America, this is a big deal. A lot of the Christian channel will feature these people all the time. And then they write books about it too. And the books sell like hotcakes, always a top seller. One of the books is called The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven. And people love things like that. And it sounds really exciting, you know, to listen to someone who say that I died, you know, and I always see that white light. It's always a white light. You know, the white light would ask me to go there and whatever. And I saw Jesus Christ. And especially this book, The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven. You know what the problem is? The problem is, of course, this is completely unbiblical and completely not in the Bible. And so everybody come up with different ideas, right? This book say that I saw Jesus Christ, he was as tall as a 10-story building. The other book say that I saw Jesus Christ, he was right in front of me and he has a very buff chest. You know, he pectoral muscle very strong, you know, and he, he's two, two ways. And sometimes he backfired badly. This book, The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven, was finally debunked because the boy himself went to declare that my father asked me to write the book. <laughs> and, and 
make a lot of money. And so the whole thing just collapsed like a pack of cards. However, it will still continue to go on and on. And outside of the Reformed Evangelical Church, it's just a big landscape of all kinds of things that are happening. Those of you who have been in the Reformed Evangelical Church may not know this. All you have to do is just to, to, to look a little bit outside. You will see how crazy the whole landscape is. And last week when I preached, I showed you and talked a little bit about the apostle, right? So things like people proclaiming themselves apostles and all that. And the genealogy, this idea that somehow there are some people who are from a godly line is still very prevalent today. And in the secular for, world, for example, the royal family in, in Great Britain. Now, we were once a British colony before. And I was born before, I was born while we are still British colony, as were some of you. So I still remember coins in Singapore that has the Queen's head on it, Queen Elizabeth's head, head on it. And if you ever, and then she came to visit Singapore, I think. Yeah, she came to visit Singapore. And, and some of our streets are still named after them. There's a Mountbatten Road somewhere near here, right? That's the Earl Mountbatten or Lord Mountbatten or some, something like that. And today, the British still hold on to the system, isn't it? You meet the Queen or whatever you're supposed to curtsy, you're supposed to, <laughs> your grace, your, 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 your excellency or whatever it is. Uh, and the world is breaking away. Just most recently, Prince uh, William, is, it, is that the guy? And his wife, pretty wife, they went to Jamaica. For what purpose? Because Jamaica said, we're going to break away. We, we don't want to recognize the Queen as our head of state anymore. So they send the royal couple to go there to charm the people, to try to, to win them back. Now, before Elizabeth became queen, she did that kind of thing as well with many of the African states. So she and uh, Philip went around and then, okay, you watch the crown, you will find out, right? It, it, that's the purpose, go and try to win them back. And they were quite successful. But too bad for the William and, and Kate Middleton, is that, is that her name? Yeah. He failed this time, you know, the Prime Minister right in his face says, sorry, uh, we're not going to care about what you do. We're going to break away. So genealogy seems to be very important that because these people are blue blood, they, they are from royal family. So when we see them, we need to uh, curtsy and to kiss their ring or something like that. And people are still obsessed with that. Unhappily, within the Church of Jesus Christ, it's still the same thing. This is a the photograph of a person by the name of Canon Tipton. And this young person holds the record as being the world's youngest evangelist. Do you know when is the first time he supposedly preached? He was 21 months old. 21 months. Huh? That you can go to YouTube and find him. What happened is that in the Pentecostal church that he belonged to, he 21 months, suddenly went onto the stage, grabbed the mic and then do his uh, babble thing. A, a little bit like Mark Neal's daughter just now inside the room. And she went, yang, 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 start to speak. You know, Give her a mic and we will proclaim her a preacher. So all of a sudden, the church believed that this is a young preacher. And why did they believe that? Because his father is a preacher, the grandfather is a preacher, you know, and it's like an anointing that goes in the family. And so this is a picture of him preaching at four years old. Today, this fellow is a teenager and he is still preaching. So at four years old, when he, now at 21, he was just preaching gibberish. But at four years old, he was quite an accomplished preacher. You can find him on the internet. And he preached certainly better than many of us seated here. And then you look at something like that and say, wow, because this fellow's father is a preacher, the grandfather is a preacher, God's hand is on the genealogy of this family. And so he is anointed. And so, yeah, it's a very special family. So you see today it's still happening. What is most frightening is that this is not new. There is this one strange, strange case called the case of Marjo Gardner. Now, I have actually shared this before and I didn't quite want to talk about it until last week, I think I was driving, I was listening to BBC Guess what? BBC is doing a special on this guy again. I was so surprised. After all these years, Marjo Gardner's name is still appearing one more time. And this is a very unusual situation because in the 1940s, Marjo Gardner was 
that child preacher, the same with this Canon Kipton person, also four years old when he first started. And again, you can find him on YouTube. His name is a combination of the word Mary and Joseph. So he become Majo. And again, the proclamation is that from special family, special background, blah, blah, blah. And so the Lord anointed a four-year-old kid to preach. And he preached up a storm, you know. You can still, when you watch him, it's like, wow, this is really quite a gifted preacher. The problem is that when Majo grew up, he continued to preach and got disillusioned by the whole scene. And in the 1970s, as he was traveling around the United States doing his preaching and evangelism, he invited a firm crew with him and revealed to the firm crew the background happening as to what's happening when I do all these things and how do I get the people to give me money and produce a firm called Majo that won the Oscar for Special Documentary in 1972. And this firm, snippets of which can still be found on YouTube today. And you can watch the firm and he, you will see him doing his talk, telling the people to give money and then going back to the hotel, sitting on the bed full with dollars and explaining how he's done. And he said that, you know, when he was four years old, his mother was the one who coached him to say this, say this, say this, say this, say this, do it this way, swing your hand this way, look at the camera this way. And he said there's a very complicated sign language thing that the mother developed. So that when he's doing his thing, he's watching his mother giving him signal, when to emphasize, when to say Jesus Christ, when to say, give me your money now and all kinds of things. And then he went on in very fine detail as to how do you get people to give money in order to praise the Lord, hallelujah, or whatever it is. For example, one of the things he said that is very common in a charismatic Pentecostal circle is that, you know, all you have to do is say that, you know, the Lord is speaking to me. There's someone out there somewhere who has a cookie jar in, in the kitchen somewhere that has $10 inside. And the Lord is speaking to me in my heart. And I'm telling that someone to give that $10 and the Lord will bless you. And Majo on firm said, come on. The probability of someone having a cookie jar in the kitchen somewhere with some money inside is very, very high. Out of the hundreds and thousands of people that listen to my radio show and also right on the spot. And of course, somebody will then give you the money and then cry and then say, oh my goodness, the Lord is speaking to me through a pastor in the middle of somewhere. And so if you watch the movie Majo and you compare it to what's happening today, especially in the charismatic churches in the United States of America and around the world. I don't know about you, but it really scares me and sends a chill down my spine. Because young child preachers like that are still very popular in the United States of America and in places like Brazil. You can go and do your research, you will find it's very scary that you have very young kids blessing people, even toddlers, doing things like that because they supposedly come from an anointed line of people. And, you know, sometimes when I watch things like that, I feel very disturbed because, you know, it, it sort of reminds me that I am in that line, isn't it? That, that I'm a preacher of the word. These people are also preachers of the word and I'm associated by profession to them. Sometimes I comfort myself by saying that, you know, in every profession, there's all this black sheep. Lah. Let's say you're in the army, right? And there's some horrible army person. You're a banker. There's some corrupt banker. You're a teacher. There's some horrible pervy teacher that go and molest children. You know, every profession, there are some. But when it comes to the ministry of the word, I think it's a lot more serious because, you know, it's got to do with the work of the devil, in my opinion. Because this is so strange that people, even after all this is done, you're still repeating the same old story over and over again. I don't know whether people are just ignorant or they don't know about the existence of Majo. So when all these things happen, the Apostle Paul says that the end result is that it promotes speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Stewardship from God that is by faith. 
the Lord has already given us the entire story, the whole counsel of God that we have received, rather than focusing on this, we now go into speculation. We go and do other things. We go and think about other things. We get excited about all kinds of funny, strange things. And it, it, I, I once mentioned to you before, right, it, it, that even in Singapore, there are people who say that our church is so marvelous that when we worship, gold dust fall down from heaven. And you know, when I was preparing for a sermon, I was got drawn into watching Majo and all these Majo things and all that. And one of the comparisons in the United States has happened too, that there are people, for all you know, the Singapore case is borrowed from the United States, right? So go, glister, come down. And, and the pastor is saying that, oh, you know, people are criticizing our church and saying that this is nonsense. But I'm not going to stop the miracle of God from happening. Uh, I, 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 I don't promote it, but I'm not going to stop it. So wow, then as he speaks, the gold dust come down from the aircon bar. Everybody, oh, praise the Lord. Rain is coming. Rain is coming. The, the spiritual rain from God is coming. And la, 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 la. Guess what? Somebody went to take the gold glitter and went to analyze and trace it all the way back to the company that produced the piece of paper that was supposedly came from God. And that's not the end of the story. There's so many all kinds of weird stuff, okay? Not only glitter from heaven, there's oil coming out from the Bible. Wow, the Bible all of a sudden, boom, got oil come out. Again, same thing. Somebody went to take the oil and trace it back to the company that produced the oil. <laughs> you know? All these things continue to bring people away from the main focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And few people think about things like that. And that's why it goes on and on, right? So sometimes when you think about things, issues like that, you ask yourself, why so serious? Huh? Why you reform evangelical church people forever? You want to bring out all these what, false teachers and why have you? And I'm very mild, right, compared to our senior pastor, uh, senior pastor, you know, sometimes when he gets into some of this teaching, he, he, he gets a little bit agitated and then he, he go and name names and, and say all kinds of things. It's quite scary sometimes when I'm translating for him, right? There was one time we were doing this indoor stadium thing and he was talking about some of these false teachers and false teachings and what have you, uh, including a person in Singapore and he named his name, came right out. And then, you know, he's speaking in, in Chinese. He got so upset. Then, what? Like, how do you translate? He's worse than a dog. <laughs> I was like, at, at the instant, I was like, is there a better word to use? He said, people like that, then, is worse than a dog. <laughs> so, and such is worse than a dog. <laughs> I can't remember what I did, but I'm always quite careful, you know. I, within a very fast split second, I will try to, uh, you know, modify it a little bit better for him. Sometimes it backfire, you turn around and say, that's not what I said, okay? You better go translate exactly what I said. Nobody asks you to water down the, the message of the servant of God. <laughs> then you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> worse than a dog. <laughs> So why, why so serious? Why is it that the Reformed Evangelical Church especially, or Reformed churches, Bible Presbyterians, you know, those are pretty conservative Reformed churches. They, people like us, people like them, we're very serious about all this false teaching and we come right out and, and whack it. Is there a need to do so? Some people say that, you know, why don't we just, you know, Huang the whole lot, you know, we're happy, Lord. you're happy, I'm happy, everybody happy, happy, happy. That's fine. I must admit that oftentimes when I listen to some of my co-workers or even <laughs> other ministry folks, there is an element of anger and hatred in the way we do things. And I call this the because I am right and you are wrong syndrome. <laughs> I think that unhappily many people in our circle like to point out false teaching and falsehood or theological problem, just to say that I'm right and you're wrong. Uh, and I would say even in the area of evangelism, that's the case. I think that many people evangelize to other people to tell you that you are wrong and I'm right. And I get a lot of happiness telling you that. That the God you, you worship is just some stupid stone or whatever it is. See, you're so stupid and I am enlightened. So let me share Jesus Christ with you. I do believe that, honestly, that's how a lot of us think about this. 
I remember many years ago, there was a young man who attended our worship service. He was very fervent. He studied the Bible and he was, you know, joining us in all kinds of activities, indoor stadium, counselor, everything. So one time in the worship service, I was talking about the false preacher laws, right? Uh, who knows about the false preacher law? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's an evangelism tool. Uh, and I, I sort of share that it's a, it's a good tool. We don't agree with it totally. What is the first rule? Do you remember? What is the first law? The first law is God loves you and have a wonderful plan for you in your life. That, that's the first law, right? So this young man came to see me and said, that, hey, you know, Pastor, you, you bring out that law. It's not correct, okay? By the reform understanding, you should go and tell the people, God hate you and God want you to burn in hell. And I said, well, look at him. He's so young. He's only a teenager, you know. Wow, but his eyes are full of fire. He's just, you going to tell you God hate you. I tell you, because the Bible says here and here and here, God hate the sinner. And it's like, wow, what is the motivation? You want me to go around telling people, hey, excuse me, God hate you, okay? So you're going to burn in hell, okay? You know how painful it is to burn in hell. So you better wake up your ideas, huh? kind of thing. And because he's, he, he's very young, I wanted to be very careful and to, to help him and to understand where he's coming from and, and spoke to him and all that. But the fact also proved that finally he was not a person who really wanted to understand faith. He really wanted to go around hammering people <laughs> because later on as he grew older and became an adult, all that, he fell off from the faith. He didn't carry on. He continued to live a life that is really a rough life. We keep fighting with people, getting into trouble, go to army, also kind of detention and all kinds of nonsense. So he had a lot of anger inside of him. So that's an example. And in the times of Jesus Christ, the Pharisees and the experts of the laws, those are the people who do that. Basically, they came to Jesus simply to tell you that you are wrong and we are right. When the apostle Paul confronted the people, told Timothy that, hey, you need to be careful and you need to go and, and, and speak to your people. The subsequent verses give us the reason. The key reason for us to do what we do must be because of love. And so Paul told Timothy that you, you got to charge these people not to talk nonsense. And verse 5 says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may we point out wrong teachings and false doctrines and all this weirdness that is going out on out there because of love. That's what Paul told Timothy, the aim of our charge. Why do you go and charge these people? It must be because of love. Love for God and all things relating to God. Because you love God, you must love God's truth. I have always believed that we are not just followers of Jesus Christ, you know. We are followers of the way, the truth, and the life. And so all true followers of Jesus Christ must feel pain when the truth is violated when injustices has happened, when people portray falsehood and present it as truth, and because you love the word of God, you then for believe that we have to make sure that this don't carry on because it's going to hurt a lot more people. And it comes first of all from the love of God. It also comes from the love of the people of God. And this, I believe, should be something which all of us would do because we love God, we love the people of God, and when we see the people of God being misled, suffering, and and being deceived, it would pain our heart. And this is pastoral as well, right? And if you know, the pastor should be the person who is pained when he sees the pain of other people. And that's a key difference between a pastor and your counsellor, who a paid counsellor, you know. You know, a paid counsellor is somebody you pay and then the guy counsel you, lah, whatever, whether it's a depression or marital problem or personal whatever issue, right? So the guy is always watching at the watch because you're, you're paying for one hour of the first time only, ma. 
And so I've talk, spoken to so many of you, right? Sometimes you guys come and tell me that, you know, I went to see these psychiatrists and all of you. And you notice that psychiatrists keep looking at the watch when they speak to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm, you got problem with your mother, right? Yeah, mm, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, when the time is up, press the button. Then the nurse will come in and say, excuse me, your time is up. <laughs> and there you go. The pastor is different. Now, this is not to say that you should make your pastor speak to you for 20 hours as a row. Uh. But a true blue pastor will be one who cares. Who, who's motivated by the love of God, which then extends to the love of the people. And so I tell you often that if you ask me what's the hardest part of my work, I would say the hardest part of my work is that pain, looking at people's life and, and, and knowing that it can be better, that it should not be like this, that if only you understand the truth of God, it will set you free. And then, and then knowing that uh, yeah, it's very difficult because it's multiple layer and it, it gets stuck, right? And it's not just about you guys, okay, in, in the work that I do for Habitat for Humanity. You know, we clean up the houses of the elderly poor because Habitat as a, a Christian charity is very focused on shelter-related issue. And the rules are very strict, you know. We don't do things beyond the shelter. We don't go and educate the kid la, or feed the old people. Or that We just take care of proper sheltering. That's our focus. That's our niche area. But you also know that that's not all the solution, right? Uh, because there's so much issue. Why is Akong and Ama willing to live in a house crawling with cockroaches and bed bugs all over the place? I mean, you guys at home got one cockroach only like, like apocalypse come already. You scream and shout and make a lot of noise. Yeah, I always tell you, right, when we, we got all these young people to come to clean out these houses as the volunteers, if you suddenly hear a volunteer scream loudly, usually it's a man and usually it's cockroaches. Don't know how many times I've seen it already. Ah! you go to see Simi Tai Chi or cockroach. That's why I say uh, NS are uh, no need. Uh. All the enemy need to do is release cockroach, we surrender tomorrow, you know. And, and why would people live like that? The answer is because there's a lot of dysfunctionality in their life. All kinds of nonsense in their background. Some of them have children and the kids don't want to be with them. The worst case, I've seen one lady, Indian lady who was mentally not sound. So she poo in her one room flat everywhere, poo, okay? So brown thing on the floor, they are not mud. Huh? And it's like one of the most scary thing. And so volunteers ask them to clean. The volunteers say, huh? how come like that? Why this fellow like that? Got kids or not? I say, four. The volunteers say, ha, huh? four. Ah. Tian da lei pi. Tian di li bu yong. The, the kid will get struck by lightning, blah, blah, blah. And then it went on and on. I told the volunteer, you are assuming that she was a good mother. And then all of a sudden, all the volunteers keep quiet. Nobody there to say anything anymore. It's a very complicated issue. But at the back of my mind, in my depth of my heart, I know that this is the result of the fallenness of man. Isn't it? And it's, it's like just crazy, you know, how this got to be solved. And that's the hardest part of doing what I do. The Bible tells us that we must even have love for the enemies of God. Love your enemy. You pray for them. And all this caused Paul to tell Timothy, you go and charge them. Not because go and tell them we are right and you are wrong. We got the best theology, the lousiest theology. No, because of all this that should come from a heart that comes of love. The last one is a little bit tricky. I must say that you must have some uh, wisdom in that as well. Because some enemies of God are really seriously evil people. Psychopath of sorts. Recently, I've been watching this Netflix show about psychopath. You've got to be a bit worried that your pastor likes to watch shows relating to psychopath. A very human behavior pattern. And there was this serial killer that I killed, don't know how many women kind of thing. And he just don't feel anything, you know. And he just sort of confess it as if he just told you, hey, I went to 7-Eleven to buy a cup of tea. It's as plain as that. Uh, by the way, I just killed another woman. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So when you deal with people who are seriously sick and evil, you, you must be very careful with the love that you show them. And Tim, this Paul then went on to at least segregate three areas. There are three things you need to have. First, a pure heart. And I want to tell you that when the Bible uses the word pure heart, uh, it's not just your normal purity here. Coming from Matthew 6, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Oh, I'm particularly attracted by this particular verse and I spent a lot of time thinking about this purity. The original Greek word that Paul used is katharas, 
which is again not your usual word of purity. It's a word that has many meanings. It's pure, it's unmixed, it's unstained, not tarnished, innocent, upright. Only possible when Jesus Christ cleanses your heart that way. So your motivation must be a pure one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Very hard to explain, I would say, but how wonderful it is to be together with people who, whose heart is made pure by Jesus Christ. And ministry becomes so much better and so much enjoyable. You don't have to double guess whether this guy has a good intention. And Paul emphasizes it by the next word, good conscience. Again here, the word conscience is a very unusual word in the original Greek. It's sine de sios, which is root word for synthesis, joined together. It is a joint situation. It's not just liang xing, you know. It, it, it is knowing and doing and having the correct knowledge and action joined together. And so uh, the theologian William Barclay put it this way. The Christian thinker is the man whose thoughts and whose deeds give him the right to say what he does. And that is the most acid test of all. I mean, a lot of you know the theory, right? A lot, a lot of us know the theory. You've got the right to say it or not. The moral authority to say it. The moral authority comes from whether you actually would do it. So, one of the things that's very odd is that I keep getting invited by many people to go and speak about social work and don't know about helping the poor and, and what have you. You know why? Because I've been doing it so long already. And apparently, it's very hard to find a pastor who do things like that. <laughs> So the, the, the kid, hey, you want to talk, okay, church season, now we talk about the poor, okay, call Yong Teming to come, kind of thing, you know, which, which is a bit odd. Uh. But I would say that at least I have some moral authority on this because I've done it in my life. And so that's what this good conscience means. You, you're very clear that what you are saying is what you are doing as well. And then finally, a sincere faith. Again, the Greek word is anipokrito, which means it's unhypocritical, Unfeigned, I mean, not, not fake one, real, sincere faith, a faith that has no hypocrisy. And what is the, the, the purpose of all this? I go to someone, tell this person that, hey, you know, what you are doing is not right, what you are teaching is not right. It's because of the love I have for God, the love I have for the people, the love I have even for people who are enemies of God. And I do this that it's a very real thing. I really, really do it out of a pure heart, a heart that is not stained and consistent as well. This combination is really a little bit difficult to find. And the Apostle Paul says that these three things are most important. Purity of heart, goodness in conscience, and a faith that is real, a sincere faith. The problem is that there are many people who do not do this. So verse 6 says, certain persons by swerving from this. That that means you have these people who are not pure in their heart, don't have good conscience, don't have sincere faith. They wander away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertion. So like the child preacher if you ever watch them on the YouTube, wow, very confident. Confident assertion. They come and tell you. Four-year-old, the Majo, I listen to him. He said, you ought to call them smoke, all these filthy cigarettes. Well, it sound very good. If you call the kid, hey, four-year-old, come. You know what's a cigarette or not? Don't know. My mother tell me to say that, so I tell you. you know, confident assertion. Yeah, but then again, Actually, there is no understanding. So the Apostle Paul said that these are the people that will bring the church into the wrong place. And it is our charge to ask them to stop doing this or to correct them because they all want to be teachers of the law. Let me explain a little bit and then I will end. Teachers of the law. Now, a lot of people want to be teachers of the law, especially in places like the United States. They have a culture that encourages people to stand up in front of the crowd and talk. 
don't know whether you know this or not. Our culture is very conservative, right? I mean, among all of you, you have to arrow any one of you and say, okay, next week you take the pulpit, you panic, you know, ah, next week, okay, no, you give me one year, I prepare. La. <laughs> then you prepare in front of the mirror, you talk, 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 you, you try to practice, right, your, your sermon. In the United States of America, they, they don't have that problem because their education system is different. Since your kids young, they make you do show and tell. You know what show and tell? They, every, every kid will have to stand up in front of class and talk. Show and tell, show something. You take a piece of rock and then you start to talk about the rock. You take a turtle and talk about the turtle. So they are very good at that kind of thing and they are very expressive. And so they go into entertainment, a creative industry, that kind of thing they do very well. And because of that, a lot of people want to be preachers and to, to speak in front of the public. They, they can do very well at that too. And I suppose sometimes when we are watching us, pastor or preacher or another, we think, hey, I want to be teachers of the law or I want to teach other people what to do. May I tell you, first of all, that the Bible takes a very dim view of this. James 3, 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. And James said that. For you know, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So this is the word of God. I thought my Sunday school teacher all a year like that. Then how are we all trying to recruit people? You go and tell people don't be teachers of the law. But that's what the Bible says. So it is a job not to be taken lightly. However, the Bible is very clear. The teachers very important. But if you mess around, remember Hebrew 10.31. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So when I watch all these child preachers and all these nonsense preachers out there who have private jets and con their people to pay money for the handkerchief that they just touch, I always remember this verse. Wow, I tell you, these people are very tuata in Hokkien, very daring, because the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Having said that, it is also clear from the Bible that teaching is a noble task. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor or the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you look at the list, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. So all of you who teach, whether it's a Sunday school, whether it's a cell group, whether you lead the kids, or whether you share among some people, you are listed on par, on the same level, or the same consideration point as the apostles and the prophets, and the evangelists and the pastors. So our senior pastor, Dr. Stephen Tong, once said that he thinks that all teachers must be ordained. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Right? Like, so for us, our tradition is we only ordain the, 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 the reverence. La. The rest, even the preacher is like, a, okay, la, Chan Tao is a little bit uh, not an ordained position, but the reverend is. So for example, if I die, right? So the reverend, the elder, these are all ordained position. If I die, my tombstone can say Reverend Yong Teng Meng. Yeah. Because ordained. You, you don't see deacon, whoever, whoever. Deacon, not, not, no count. The elder, yes. Elder and the reverend. So it's a very serious thing. So Dr. Tong thinks that teachers should be ordained because it's the same line here. For what purpose? For the purpose of bringing all the people of God to full maturity. So if you are teaching, you are having a noble task and a blessed task, whether you are teaching toddlers or you are teaching adults. For what purpose? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful scheme. Rather, speaking the truth in love. So you see the consistency? Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. In your second responsive reading, you read from 2 Peter. And Peter said, Exactly the same thing. There's so many false teachers, so many strange things going on out there. And he kept warning the people. So if you are a teacher of the law, you have a noble task. You are to help your people to present 
them from being tossed and about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. It's just scary. Scary to me to think that so many daily evangelists in the United States of America have private jets. Some of them don't even have one. They have like three because they know how to get the money like Majo has mentioned by craftiness and in deceitful skin. At the end of the day, we are together to form the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. What's the last two? Three words? In love. Again, back to love. Okay, so at the end of this sermon then, some of you sit down there and say, okay, hang on, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> you got nothing to do with me. I'm just one of the many, many people who comes to church, right? Guess what? You are all already teachers of the law. Every single Christian. You are teachers of the law, of course, when you actually lead a cell group, when you teach the Sunday school, when you are preaching from here or teach at Westminster or whatever. But you are also teachers of the law because people are seeing your life. Your friends, your colleague come and ask you, hey, what do you think about this, whatever, LGBTQ? Uh? And you say, don't know, eh? I don't know. You are already teaching something. Except in this case, you are teaching ignorance. Huh? <laughs> then people think that, oh, your faith is so lousy. You, you don't have an answer to some of the pressing issues of our days. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are already a teacher of the law, whether you like it or not. John MacArthur Jr. put it this way, you are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read. Isn't it true? You, you, you talk about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to your friends, to your colleagues, and all that. you are the Bible that they will read, you know. Some of them will never read the Bible, isn't it? But they look at you, you say you're Christian. I know that some of you are already thinking, uh, oh, then better don't tell people I'm Christian. <laughs> then you escape. Oh, it's forever thinking the other way around uh, because we are all influenced by the devil. This is why I always challenge you, right? Wherever you are, you say grace before you eat. Then you tell me like already in, in Hokkien. Cannot escape. You are with your colleague, you say grace before you eat your food. Then your colleague cannot escape. You say, well, this guy Christian, man, you know. Then you say, you're very difficult. Eh? After that, they think that, huh? Um, when I work that time, I must have some flexibility, lah, you know. So if people don't know I'm Christian, they're more flexible. I can do more things. Then you get it all wrong. Go back to the Bible. You are already teacher of the law. And so the correct idea really should be that when we know that we are already teachers of the law, let us not behave like all these strange people in the days of the Apostle Paul, in the church of Ephesus back in his days, or all these weird people that we have all around us today. You ought to know the word of God well and testify to the word and teach it by love, by purity in heart, by a good conscience and with a sincere faith. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for speaking to us through your word. Although... Paul wrote this letter so very long ago. It continued to be so real to us all today. For the more things change, the more things remain the same. There are still so many deceits going on all over the world and comes from the evil of the human heart. People who are complete con men and women going out there to fleece the people of God. Sometimes it comes from people who are just mistaken. Whatever the case may be, we also can see the work of the devil among us. And he has been working for millenniums. And so his tricks and his deceits are all so sophisticated that oftentimes we just don't realize it. Sometimes when we feel that everything is at peace, perhaps it's because we are already in the trap. Grants to us a discerning heart and spirit so that we can tell the truth. And as Paul said to Timothy, may we also know how to correct the wrong perceptions and point out the deceits, not out of an arrogant spirit, but a spirit of love, from a heart that is pure, from a conscience that is good, and from a faith 
that is sincere and not fake. I we know that we are far away from this, but this is what your word tells us we must do. So may we learn to grow to be more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ, together with other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as we walk together. And as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, grow together into the full stature of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful life experience that would be. Help us to do just that in humility, support one another, encourage one another, always referring to the truth in our life so that we can always speak the truth out of love and not out of pride. These are difficult lessons, but we know that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will slowly but surely grow into it day by day. May we surrender ourselves to you so that our life will be a life that is worthy. And when we shall see you face to face again, you will say that we have been good and faithful in the task that you have given to us. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.